am here to talk about creating healthy family structures in this culture of addiction. It is hard. We live in a culture of addiction. You can't drive down the road without seeing a billboard for alcohol. You can't look at a magazine without seeing alcohol. You can't watch TV. You can't be a part of this culture without having to address addiction. Drugs for restless legs. I mean, there's every time you watch TV, there's some form of substance being advertised. All happy families are similar. Unhappy families are unique, basically. And what does a happy family have? They have good communication, respect, engagement with one another, group ethic, and individuation. There are many, many healthy parents out there who have done their best to create families with this, within this context and still wound up with addicted kids. I have seen parents I would pay to have as parents have addicted kids. On the other hand, I've also seen parents who probably don't have any business being parents have stellar kids. It is a genetically predetermined, predis, predisposed disorder addiction is. So if we think of addiction as a genetic loading of the gun and the environment fires it, we are in a serious issue with our culture. What do we see as family healing strategists, as people who work with those who are struggling with addiction and the families, we see amazing people. We see artistic, creative, sensitive, maybe even a little bit more sensitive than the rest of us. Maybe they don't have quite enough myelin on their nerves. Maybe they are charming and using all their charm to further their addictive propensities. Unfortunately, many are addicted. They're financially supported by their parents. They're not going to school. They are living in their basements playing World of Warcraft for hours and hours at a time. They are living aimlessly and they're not managing their health. That's what I'm seeing. And that's, sometimes it's with addiction and sometimes it's just what I call failure to launch or underfunctioning. What are the characteristics of the underfunctioning? Perhaps even the addicted? Lack basic coping skills. Grandiose, unrealistic, emotionally brittle, adverse to struggle, lacking impulse control, aimless, insecure, and entitled. Since 1970, the percentage of people who are living at home has increased 48%. After launching. According to Monster.com, 40% of 2008 grads still lived at home as of 2011, three years after graduating college. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the typical 30 year old is completing the same milestones as the 25 year old in 1970. So we're seeing this extended adolescence and we're seeing the failure for people to assume adult lives. And what are they talking about with adult milestones? getting married, having kids, getting a career. It's estimated, and these are the statistics, at 22%, and this is an income, 75,000 and more. We're not talking about inner city poverty. <coughs> We're talking about middle America. 22% of kids 18 to 25 are addicted. Approximately 24 million people of all ages and genders are struggling with an eating disorder. Eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any and one in four adults, approximately 61.5 million Americans experience mental health issues in this given year. How do we avoid problems? One, know your genetic history. Talk to your kids. Talk to your other family members. Be out about what's going on in your families. Discuss the impact of destructive behaviors on the family on the family, not just on them. And emphasize the importance of having a sense of purpose in the world. Incentivize positive behavior. Coventry Edwards Pitt, in her book, Race Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise, often parents make it possible to financially, for their children, to sidestep the working world in ways that less fortunate kids could never afford to do. Unwittingly, depriving their children of invaluable life experiences. This robs them of a chance to push through difficult times and to develop a clear sense of purpose. Tim is a 19-year-old with few friends, no purpose, little ambition. He lives in his parents' house. The one pleasure he reports is smoking marijuana, which he does 
all the time. Trying to galvanize Tim into action, Tim's mother wakes him up each day at noon with a to-do list. Noon being the operative word here, folks. She ultimately accomplishes his to-do list without a word. She regularly pursues the internet for exciting job opportunities for Tim and leaves him notes which he ignores. His parents are frustrated, worried, and at a complete loss how to help him other than provide financial support. What might be the problem? Well, we know if he's talking about smoking pot all the time, that may be <coughs> the underlying issue. It also might be a mental illness issue. It might be an undiagnosed cognitive disorder. It could be a lot of things. Leaping to just the idea that it's got to be addiction may miss the issue and it may actually hide what is going on. We need to be open-minded that it might be addiction and a mental illness. It might be addiction and an undiagnosed cognitive disorder. And it may be just plain failure to launch. What are the typical family responses? We ignore the issue and hope they'll disappear, right? It's just pop. We rationalize, we minimize, and discount the behavior. Or we observe the behavior and try and fix the situation by over-functioning, placating, manipulating, rewarding dysfunction, and protecting them from the consequences of their own behavior. So let's talk about the cycle of dysfunction. If you've got an addictive kid or an addicted kid, what you know is that they're not functioning at a premium, right? They can't. They can't function at a premium. So they may no longer set their alarm in the morning. Who sets the alarm? You guys do. And the more you do, the less they do. And the less becomes the new norm. If it used to be forbidden in our house to swear, we're okay as long as it's, we're not being called the effing B. If it used to be we'd expect them to set their own alarm clock, we're thrilled if they just would get up before noon. And the lower the standard, and the more that becomes the new normal, the more we remain in denial. Because then we can tell ourselves, he's doing OK. We've adjusted our definition of normal. What's normal? All the kids smoke pot. In Tim's case, you know, maybe some of his friends aren't working. Maybe some of his friends aren't in college. Maybe some of his friends are smoking pot. We look at that group of people, and we think to ourselves, he's normal. We adjust our definition of acceptable. What did Tim's parents teach him? Tim was not responsible for his own sense of well-being. That there are no consequences for Tim's choices. That <coughs> happy may be in and of itself a viable goal. Let's talk about happy for a minute. And what is happy to a drug addict or alcoholic? So when we're concerned about making them happy, and I see parents doing this all the time, I just want to keep them happy. Because the, the theory is if they're happy enough, they won't need to use. Because we do have this sense. We have this sense that addiction is born of medication of pain, right? We think that they're miserable and that's why they're using. So we think if we can do the happy dance and keep them around, keep them happy, we can keep things smooth enough that they'll be okay. But what that might teach them is that happy is an attainable, permanent state. And nobody is happy all the time. When my son was in second grade, he came home and he said, I'm not happy and you don't care. And I said, I know. <laughs> it's a feeling. It comes, it goes. It comes and it goes. Happy to a drug addict is drugs. So what we need to do is make being a functional person the goal, not happy. Being in recovery the goal, not happy. Tim's parents are trying to teach him that pain and struggle are avoidable. Pain and struggle are not avoidable. That is life. And we cannot change the terms of life. Parents can and will handle all the issues as they arise. Can't do that either for them, or we're going to be depriving them of lessons they need for life. And parents will keep filling the gaps of functioning, even as the gaps grow wider. What were the consequences for Tim? He lacked coping strategies. He continued smoking. He continued not functioning. 
failed to reach adult milestones, expected immediate gratification, and he had no motivation to change. What is addiction? Addiction is a <coughs> neurobiological disorder with chronic, genetic, and environmental features. What does that mean? It means that the brain <coughs> of an addict has actually changed. It means that it's not going back to the way it was before they became an addict necessarily. It doesn't mean it won't be, that they won't be functional people again. But once a cucumber becomes a pickle, it never becomes a cucumber again. And that is true for addiction as well. What does this mean? It means that once they're in recovery, they need to continue being in recovery. We can't look at 30-day programs as the answer. It isn't all better. It means that they have to actually put in the time for recovery to change their brains. They need to focus on that which is healthy and become productive human beings. And also, they may need to change their environments. And sometimes those environments might be your homes and their neighborhoods. What does normal adolescent and adult, young adult brains do? These are the norms, forgetful, impulsive, poor judgment, misunderstanding, misreading, misinterpreting, stay up late, can't get up early, moody, oversensitive, hysterics, shocking dress, tattoos, and piercing, alcohol, drug use, argue with logical and rational reason, messy rooms, lockers, and bedrooms. Now, it's all about the prefrontal cortex. We basically have three brains. We have a primitive brain, which is responsible for our autonomic functioning, our heart rate, our breathing, all part of the primitive brain. We do not need to tell the heart to beat. It is governed by the primitive part of the brain and it just does it. Moving up is what's called the midbrain. And the midbrain has the limbic system in it and our sense of survival lives in the midbrain. That which we need deem necessary for survival is controlled by that midbrain. What does their alcoholic think is necessary for survival? Drugs or alcohol. It isn't that they want to use. It is that that brain of theirs is telling them that they needed it. It transforms from something they want to do to something they need to do in order to feel normal or okay. And their brains are also telling them that they may need it for survival. So when you think of some of the behaviors that addicts or alcoholics engage in just to get their drugs and alcohol, don't judge it too harshly because it may well be driven by this survival need. My friend Dylan talks about the idea that when he was craving heroin, it was as if he had a plastic bag over his head. He couldn't get quite enough oxygen. It was that serious for him. Moving up is the prefrontal cortex. Now the prefrontal cortex is all about adult functioning, executive functioning. It is responsible for moral compass. It's responsible for judgment planning, impulse control. All of the things listed up there that we think of as adult brain. This part of the brain is not completely developed until mid to late 20s, best case. And when you add drugs and alcohol in there at age 14, 15, 16, it is delaying the development. So what does a brain without a functioning prefrontal cortex sound like? Go ahead, steal the necklace. She never wears the necklace. <laughs> or you can drink and drive. Drunk driving the bus, they're for amateurs and you're a pro. Go ahead, go ahead. You can put a needle in your arm because you know exactly how much to do. A functioning prefrontal cortex would sound more like this. You know, you put a needle in your arm, you might die. <laughs> you drink and drive, you might hurt somebody other than yourself. You steal your mother's necklace, she may never trust you again. It's like the angel and the devil on the shoulders. It's not, it is not that this voice, this moral voice is gone. It's that it's just so much quieter than go ahead, steal the necklace. I was at a wedding a few years ago and sitting next to me was an old friend of mine who has multiple years of recovery from heroin. And sitting in front of us was this woman who had these huge golf ball sized pearls on, luminescent, they were shining in the sun. 
And I'm sort of staring at them. I should have been staring at the bride and groom, but I'm staring at the pearls. And he elbowed me, and he said, I still want to steal the necklace. <laughs> and I laughed, and I asked him what that was about. He said, I was a really good thief. I would have had that necklace off of her. I would have had it in my pocket. I would have been at the pawn shop, and I would have been at my dealer in 20 minutes. I said, and then what? He said, what do you mean? I would have gotten high. I said, and then what? And he paused for quite a while, and he thought about it. And he said, as I was coming down, because there is always a coming down, I would have felt remorse. I would have felt remorse. But I had no way of coping with the remorse so I would get high again. And that's the cycle. They use because it's driven by a survival need. Their prefrontal cortex, which is their stop sign, is not operational. They use, they feel bad about it. They do feel shame. They do feel remorse. They do feel all of the things you really wonder if they ever feel. But they have no way of coping with that because they haven't learned how to cope with pain. If every time you encounter pain and struggle, you smoke dope, or you drink alcohol, or you snort some heroin, what do you learn about coping strategies? Not much. You learn that drugs and alcohol help you cope. It numbs pain. It numbs pain. That's what you learn. And you don't learn the other lessons that life teaches.